In today's episode, we take a look at the murder of Gordon Johnston, a crime that shot the UK. Not just because of the 48 axe and crowbar wounds found on his body, but the way his killers were identified. The first part will be the reconstruction, and the second part will be the police investigation. We start tonight in Dundee, though the men police need to interview could come from anywhere in Britain. Two months ago, on Monday the 8th of May, a shopkeeper was attacked in his own shop in Union Street in the city centre. Gordon Johnston died from his injuries. He was married with two children aged 12 and 9. Many of the witnesses to the events that day have taken part in our reconstruction. Dundee, with its famous bridge across the Tay, attracts shoppers from around the east of Scotland. At the heart of the shopping centre is Union Street, and one of the oldest shops there is Gow's for guns and fishing tackle. How's the family? Very well, actually. It's Alistair, I'm in about I'm looking for a gun for him. He's joining the gun club. Something to get... Gordon Johnston had been working here since he left school at the age of 16 in 1955. He began as an assistant and had now become manager and sole employee. That's perfect. How much is that? 29.95. Can I bring him in and let him have a look at it? Ah, yes. I'll put it aside for you. That'd be fine. OK, Mr. Lawson. Bye now. Thanks. Bye-bye. It's Monday, May the 8th. Gordon took the 9A route each day to travel into town, and on that morning, regular passengers remember him as usual. He was seen getting off the bus opposite Burton's at about 8.45 that morning, and he then walked along the Nethergate to the shop. Shortly before nine, he was seen removing the grills that protect the windows, but he left the grills on the door. Then, before opening the shop to customers, Gordon went on a couple of errands. Morning. At the gas board showroom, the till receipt shows he dropped in to pay his bill at three minutes after nine. That's three pounds and seven pounds. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Mr. Johnson then went shopping. Gordon Taylor, a bank employee, met him back near Gow's. He glanced up at the church clock and remembers it was 9.14. About then, another witness was heading up Union Street. Well, I went to the bakers and did some messages, and they walked up past the shop. And as I was passing the man bending down, I heard the remark. I slept in this morning. And there was two men at the window who maybe he's speaking to. A salesman phoned Gow's sometime between 9.15 and 9.20, and someone answered. Ah, oh, good morning. It's Mr. Travers of Whatmore Clothing. Look, uh, we have a new range of outdoor jackets, and I think you'd be... Mr. Travers doesn't know who he spoke to, but assumed it was Mr. Johnson. He thinks whoever answered was used to dealing with reps, and described him as sounding middle-aged. Yeah, fine. Mm -hmm. Well, well, actually, I'll be up in Dundee later today, so is it all right if I drop by? Ah, oh, that's great. That's fine. Well, look, I'll see you later. John Richmond is the postman for the district. He was surprised to find Gow's shut and was unable to deliver the mail. We know that was at 9.24, since a few doors up, he crossed the road to Henderson's Jewellers and was recorded on their security camera, which shows a clock. By this time, the town was filling up, and police need to hear from anyone who visited the area of the Nethergate and Union Street. The first shopper known to visit Gow's that morning was John Bishop. I came down Union Street to go into Gow's to buy some fishing tackle. So I tried the front door, it was locked. I looked at my watch, it was 9.38. A man's head appeared from behind the shop door. And as I turned to walk down the street, his head appeared again. He didn't seem concerned that he'd seen me at all. A few minutes later, Marion Davidson went to the shop. As she tried the door, she heard a voice. Wait a minute! She didn't have time to wait and went to work. Kenneth Hastie was walking up Union Street, and so was Linda Galozzi. 
When Linda drew level with Gauss, she saw a man acting suspiciously and she stopped to watch. He seemed to be having trouble locking the door. That was suspicious. Yeah. Some people really don't. Mr. Hasty remembers that the man disappeared behind a red van parked outside Scott's bar. So when, what, when Inside the bar, this? the owner was talking to a member of her staff. Are you open? No. At the other end of Union Street, on the Nethergate, Mickey Liddell was driving into town when a man ran right out in front of him. By 4.30, a customer had become so concerned, he'd summoned the police. They discovered Gordon Johnston's body. His watch had been smashed and had stopped at 21 minutes past the hour. In fact, the hour hand was broken in the attack, but presumably it was 21 minutes past nine, which means that it's very important to identify those two men who were seen looking through the, looking into the shop window a little bit earlier. Indeed, yes. One is described as in his late thirties and five feet nine inches in height. The other is smaller and described in his twenties. He's of stouter build than the first one. Now, one of the witnesses, as we saw in the reconstruction, actually saw a face inside the shop. Yes, unfortunately it's only half a face because, as you would see in the film, the window was obscured and we could only see the, the witness could only see the top part of the man's face. He describes him as being 40 to 50 years, 5 foot 9 inches in height, slim build and pointed craggy features. Even so, it's quite a, quite a detailed crime watch video fit, that. It is, yes. Now, we've got an even more detailed one, or at least uh, we've got a more complete video fit because this is the man seen running away from the shop. That's right. Or at least man walking is, away briskly. This man carrying a gun case is described as 25 years, again 5 foot 9 inches in height, of average build and sharp features. He had dark collar length hair and he was wearing light denim jeans and witnesses have described his clothing as either a light uh, anorak, which was dark blue in colour, or a jerkin and it had a hood, but this hood may have been attached to an undergarment. OK, it's quite similar to the video fit that we saw, the half video fit earlier. Now, it also is quite similar to a man who was picked up by that security camera in the jeweller's shop shortly after 9 o'clock, isn't it? That is correct, yes. What time was, was this uh, taken? This? this was shortly after 9 at the same jeweller's shop, and it may have been that this man uh, was innocently going to a railway station, a bus station or whatever, but we haven't traced them and it's imperative that we do. Here it is again, we'll freeze on that point. Now if that was you, and if you were innocently going about your business that morning, a little bit after nine o'clock, please do call us right away now. There was a clasp knife found as well, this outside Scott's Bar, which is on the route that uh, the man was seen walking away fairly briskly, you suspect this might have been stolen from Gowers? Yes, Mr Johnson did sell such knives, but unfortunately we cannot say how many have been stolen, or indeed this is the only one. So if anybody was uh, offered uh, an Opinel French clasp knife in suspicious circumstances, particularly in the Tayside area, you need to hear from them. That is correct, yes. Now, he was a popular man in the vicinity, and I know local people have been very upset, let alone the family. Very much, yes. They've, they've got together a reward? Yes, uh, the proprietors of the shop and their associates in the area have put forward a reward of £12,000 for information which will lead to the arrest and the conviction of the person or persons who have committed this crime. OK, well, we know that Mrs Johnston and the children are watching tonight. If you think in any way you can help, here's the number to ring in the studio. It's 01811 8055. Or you can ring Tayside Police. The Crime Watch Reconstruction received plenty of calls, but nothing police could run with. Until a call received to police later, wherein a substantial reward was offered. The phone calls from one of the killer's uncle. 
and then police had the sinister full story. What well, started out as a disturbing fantasy, a kidnap soon turned into cold bloody murder when two friends got together to put their evil plans into motion. Ryan Monks and Paul Mill planned to kidnap the elderly mother of a local bakery owner and hold us a ransom for £200,000. Ryan Monks and Paul Mill were two unremarkable young men, aged 22 and 21 at the time. They went to Lawside Academy together, where Monks was a daydreamer and introvert, while Mill was a smart lad with a certain charm. Having worked at the bakery, Ryan Monks knew the company was doing well, and enlisted the help of his friend to put his plans into motion. Thankfully for the baker and his mother, the plot was not carried out, but this was not due to the killers abandoning their plans. Instead, events had taken an even more sinister turn during the course of collecting their supplies for the future kidnap, resulting in the untimely death of Gordon Johnston. Gordon Johnston was 54 years old and was managing Gow's gun shop in Union Street when Ryan Monks and Paul Mill entered the shop. Using what was described as a brutal attack, he was viciously murdered. The shop plundered a variety of weapons, ammunition and cash. Ryan Monks and Paul Mills were believed to frequent the shop, so it was likely that Johnston knew his attackers. 48 axe and iron bar wounds were counted on his hacked and lifeless body, found by a policeman after lying dead in the shop all day. Young killers had locked the front door behind them, giving themselves time to escape before the alarm was raised. It is not known if Johnston was alive when they left the crime scene, but his injuries were sufficient to believe that he died at the hands of his attackers. Monks confessed to his uncle Lucia Lanetta soon after the murder, asking him to help burn the bloodstained jeans, trainers, and a jacket which Monks had brought to his home in a plastic bag. Frightened and confused, Lynette complied and threw the clothes into his fire. Giving evidence at the trial, Lynette told the jury he had helped his nephew by a set of car license plates days before the murder, unaware of his nephew's plans at that time. Seemingly unable to cope with the pressure of endless media campaigns and pictures of Gordon Johnston's face, Monks's uncle turned his nephew and Mill over to the police. But it was later reported his uncle had handed them over to the police in order that he could claim the reward for information leading to their apprehension. Both the youths were arrested and a trial took place at Perth Sheriff Court in November 1989, with Lord Mayfield presiding. During the trial, both men blamed each other for the murder, insisting they were merely the getaway driver, while Silver was, in fact, the murderer. Detective Sergeant Edward Boyle interviewed Mill after a stash of armaments were found at his home and was initially advised by Mill that he was nowhere near the shop at the time of the murder. When pressed about this, Mill reportedly changed his story and said that he picked up his friend, Monks, that morning and had driven into the gun shop where he was complicit but not part of the robbery. Detective Sergeant Eric Drummond told the court in a tape recorded interview Monks alleged that he was a driver, and Mill was the one who carried out the attack. According to Monks' account, he stayed in the car for a while before entering the shop to see what was going on. He maintained he spoke briefly to Mill before returning to the car to wait his return. When Mill reportedly returned to the car, Monks claimed Mill had changed his clothing whilst ordering Monks to drive. In reference to the burning of the clothes, Monks stated they belonged to Mill, and he was merely getting rid of them for him. Diana Henderson, Mill's girlfriend at the time, told the court how months after the incident, Mill confessed to her that Monks had entered the shop with the intention of merely subduing the shop manager in order to steal the items they needed for the kidnap. But everything had gone wrong. Monks was alleged to have told Mill that his head burst open when Monks hit him during the scuffle. Monk's wife Anne also confessed to knowing about the robbery one week after it happened, but kept the information to herself. 
In a trial that lasted three weeks, the jury unanimously found both parties guilty of murder. Detailed plans relating to the kidnap attempt, as well as a postal van robbery, were found in the homes of the pair, along with various weapons and objects needed to carry out their scheme. The High Court in Edinburgh, Judge Dawson told Muggs, what happened was a calculated and brutal attack. In the light of a new human rights law, a hearing was held to determine Monk's sentence. He was given a 14-year term. His accomplice, Paul Mill, was told he must serve 13 years for the murder. Paul Mill was released in 2002 on license, whilst Ryan Monks was released in 2003.